Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Merv Goldman, CEO of Acker. I am honored and pleased uh, to welcome Maggie Henriquez, CEO of uh, Krug, and uh, Jerome Jacomoy of the Y. Did I mispronounce it? I'm sorry. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. No problem. Um, uh, Winemaker uh, for. Uh, for Krug and uh, specifically uh, Claude DeMille. And um, one of the things, we, we, we actually got a, a lot of people asking questions in advance about you, Maggie. And they, uh, they were, were curious about um, how you came, came to Krug and, and basically what you did to elevate the brand so much and a little bit about how you decided to go back to the heritage and 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 really build Krug the way you did. Well, very happy. Thank you, thank you for this invitation. Thank you for being with all of you, through you, uh, here and, and, and Lily. And uh, we are very pleased that I am here with Jerome, who's been eight years with the house as he's uh, today in charge of uh, winemaking and, uh, and the growers, which is what for, for us is extremely important. And he will give you more detail about the connection for us so critical between every vineyard and one wine. And, uh, and about me, you know, I've been um, 43 years working. I was born in a house with a father who was already in the wines and spirit business. So I grew up in this business. And uh, out of my 43 years of experience, I worked in some other industries also, 32 years have been in the wines and spirits. Before the first, uh, I would say I was started with the wines already in the 80, 82, 86. Uh, I went in the training, but I was always in the commercial side and, uh, and not in, uh, in the winemaking side. Then I moved into spirits and I was very much more into spirits. In 93, I was uh, appointed uh, um, keeper of the Quay, which is a very good, uh, important uh, recognition on the whiskey, Scotch Whiskey Association. And for some years, and there is a rum around the world today that I invented when I was 89, that is called Diplomatico. So I was very much on the spirits. And then in 2000, uh, I became press in 95. I was, uh, I went, to, I moved into, um, I left my country, I'm Venezuelan. You can rapidly see that I'm not neither French nor, nor English. And I, I grew up in my country, I married. I, am, I have two uh, sons who are 39 and 34. I have four grand, uh, grandchildren. And in the year 95, 91, I was president of Seagram. Seagram, very important American company and in Venezuela. In 95, I left, I went to Harvard and then I went to, to Nabisco. I was the president of Nabisco in Mexico. And we, it was a crisis and something that has happened to me all my life is crisis. And 92 was the first crisis in Venezuela, 95, I arrived in, in, in Nabisco in Mexico. The company was in big crisis and the, cr the country was in crisis. The industry of biscuit there was in crisis. We reinvented the company, transformed the industry, not being the leaders. We were, they, they ended being the So it was a very interesting experience, very successful. And then the group hired me and I joined the group LVMH in the year 2001 as the president of all the properties in Argentina. So Moya Tennessee properties in Argentina. And there is where my journey in the whole winemaking, wine creation, vineyards started deeper. Okay? So I had all the, 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 the tasting side, but the commercial side, but not the disconnection with the, with the winemaking and the wine growing, growing. And I have to say that, that I think I'll never go back to spirits because I, I just fell in love with wine and and what this means and the interpretation of the terroir and, and what you do to let that piece of land to express itself. And so I just fell absolutely in love. And I was, and I was uh, part of the, of, the, of the transformation in Argentina. I arrived in 2001. So if you must remember, it was the crisis exploded in, in 2002. I saw it coming. So we prepared the company and it was super successful. 
And uh, then I was invited by the group to come and run food. And this was in at the end of 2008. But I had zero connection with crew because I found crew was like an arrogant, no crew, no songs, and you know, it had nothing to do with me. I, 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 when I was invited, I said to the president, Christophe Navarre, I said, Christophe, crew, I had nothing to do with this personality. You know, arrogancy is, is the tool of people who are not confident in themselves. And uh, I, I cannot work with this house because I have nothing to do with that personality. And then he said, come on, Maggie, you have to accept. You will come. You will change everything. I know you well. And so you have to accept. You cannot say no. And then my husband today, who was my boyfriend at that time, who's a white man, he said, you cannot say no to crew, Maggie. This is a fabulous champagne. You have to say yes. Well, so I said yes. yes. And I arrived in France in, in crew. And you imagine, and I want to share this because I know there are many young people listening to this. You, I arrived and I had already 30, uh, two years, uh, 31 years of experience and I had 53 years of age. So you think, you know, I'm always very successful in turnarounds everywhere. And I saw this house, 60 people, like an atelier, small house. And I said, this is easy. So this is the formula for failure. When you think so, something is easy, you're going to fail for sure. Well, this is what happened to me my first year. So the House of Crook had been suffering in 2008 and then 2009 also. And it was the worst year in my career. I really suffered. It was, it was, it was big, big failure. But, you know, this teaches you that there is no age. You never know when failure is going to knock you a door. You have to understand that, stand up, and go get it. And then I, of course, tried to analyze what was the problem. And I realized that everybody could tell me what we were doing in crew, but nobody could tell me why we were doing what we were doing. And if you don't know the why in this world that is, is fast, there is no way you can evolve. Evolution has to be tied to the reason of being on your house. And so I realized that we didn't know anything about our founder that we didn't know why we existed. So how could we evolve if we didn't know about ourselves? And this is how we then started reconnecting with our roots that we will share with you. We understood then every step we do, how it responded to the philosophy of the founder. We're lucky enough to find a, a, a little personal notebook of the founder where he left everything written because he knew he was doing something unique. And this is the story of a house that just went back into a truth, and the more we are rooted, the further we can go. And this is how, what I have done is just to reveal the beauty of this house that has been there for 179 years, and uh, 177 years, and, uh, and probably uh, because of the family, because we have six generations, and they all felt, which is great, the founder, but it's not true. We have to go back to understand the man, that man who decided to do everything. And so Olivier, sixth generation, who works with us, embraced totally this refoundation. And we all together went through the process. We had nice anecdotes. We will share some of them with you today. And this is how the house has been transformed. And I'm very happy. And I'm very happy to share with you all also. Never under on this under estimate the problem because you may find yourself in troubles. That's the thank you. Lily, did you have, uh, were there any questions specifically for Maggie? Not yet. I think we can start. I don't know, Maggie, if you want to go right into the story of kind of what you found in exploring the history of Joseph Krug and kind of that, that deep dive to the history, because at Acker, we just did a re we recently did that. We're celebrating our bicentennial, and we- Yeah, I have seen that. this. We composed a bicentennial book to do kind of what has That's happened cool. in the past 200 years right. of Acker's history. And since you did a very similar thing for Krug, I'm curious what you discovered and kind of how the roots of Joseph Krug of really came out for that and the impact on the, on the Maison. Of course. Before I go into the story, I would like then J Jerome to introduce himself and tell him, yeah. us, uh, share with us uh, his experience. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you. I'm Jerome. Before anything, 
yeah, before anything we have to share. That's why I was close to saying just cheers before and say thank you, thank you to welcome us today. I'm really happy. Uh, why? Because a few hours ago I was in the vineyard with a grower and I said, uh, excuse me, I have to go because I have to be in New York in uh, about an hour. He said, how you can do it? And I said, believe me, I will be there. And it took maybe two seconds to be in front of you today. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, I'm especially in, in charge of uh, wine and vine development and for sure um, since uh, 2014 I'm in charge of the Claude du Menil. Uh, hopefully today I will have some moments to share with you how we, we follow the philosophy of Joseph, Joseph Kuhn that Maggie discovered a few years ago and how we, we, re, we respect it, sorry, uh, with strong principle, with the strong beliefs that we have at Kruh. So let's uh, share with you the, the story of, uh, of this man who is Joseph Kruh. He was born in 1800. He was born in Mainz. Mainz is about two hours of La Moselle. So, guy who was um, a, a, from, from 1800, uh, grew up very close to wines and, and, and growers and, and, and different type of wines in the family that the family had and tasted. This guy who was born in 1800 as French lost his nationality when he was 14 years old and because France, the, the French empire, lost Mainz to Prussians. And for him, it was very important to become French again. This is a very important piece of the story because this is what makes this man think of going in France. He left Mainz when he was 24 years old, which is quite an old person at that time. And he left as a commercial trader. So he used to sell wines from the Moselle, not producing, but selling. So he was used to know that a small grower next to another small grower will have two different wines. This is very important when we come and see what happened with this man when he left Mainz, passed through Hanau, and arrived in France when he was 34 years old, which is quite old, considering the time. He arrived and his dream was to work in Champagne. Champagne was the greatest wine in the world at that time. And he arrives to work in one of the major houses of Champagne. So you have to imagine 1834 is already 110 years after the first house of Champagne, was founded, which was Renard. And it, has, it is almost 100 years after Moet de Chandon was founded. So he arrives in an industry that is completely settled, already uh, have the, having its practices, a way of doing things. And he starts seeing the way it works in Champagne. And in 1838, he writes to the president who was very close to him because they, he ended married with the sister of the wife of the president of the house he was in. And he writes to him, we will not succeed if we do not create undisputed quality champagne. This is in 1838, but you have to imagine that the man was the president of the house he was in, wanted to be leader, so he was not thinking about his undisputed quality, top of the line champagne. And so this is how this man starts to see something different. And this is where the vision and the dream of this man is crafted. When he realizes that in champagne, every house makes a regular champagne every year. And in those good years, the climate is good. Then the house select the best wines and make a best, a better champagne. And this is called a vintage. So vintage is always going to be better than the, the champagne the house offers. And this man said, why, if champagne is pleasure, why do we have to wait for a good year to create a great champagne? I have to create the best I can offer to my clients every single year. And this becomes his obsession, his vision, his ambition. And he starts working 
And this is why I want to say that Krug is a house that shows that the, it is never late to make your dreams come true. And there will be always somebody who helps you to make it happen. And this is the story of Joseph. Joseph starts, he wrote this note, and he starts with his ambition, and he met somebody who believes in him and who invites him to do secret blending in 40, in 1840, in 1841, and 1842. And in November 1842, he is invited by this man to take over the house, majority on this house, and this is the house that ended having the name of him, who was the owner and responsible for the champagne making. And this is how the House of Krug is born in 1843. 43 years old that time is about 60 years old today. So you may say this man knew what pleasure was about because he got married when he was 41. His first son was born when he was 42. And he ended founding the House of Krug in 1843. And he was very clear that his obsession was that he wanted a house that could offer champagnes of the same quality. And he would only create champagnes at the highest possible quality. So you have to remember that these men came from Mainz. Champagne has a different approach to champagne making. And he says, I don't want to wait for a good year to make a great champagne. And if you don't want to wait for a great year to make a great champagne, you need to go plot by plot because in bad years, you may have a very heterogeneous situation and you don't have the wines all at that level. So the whole savoir faire that Jerome will take us through is born from the objective of being able to create this very high level champagne at every, every year and no difference in quality within the champagnes of the house. And so what this man did is that in 1848, his ideas were solidly clear. And for him, he had achieved completely his principles and philosophy and concept. He knew he was doing something unique in champagne that nobody was doing because it was a different approach. He invented something different. So he decided to leave everything written in a personal notebook to his son. And his son knew that you could not understand this house if you couldn't read this book. So he put this little book, which was written in 1848, in a wooden box when the father died in 1866. He put it in a wooden box and it remained in that wooden box for 100 years. Nobody ever opened it until in 1970s, the grandfather of Olivier Crook, who works with us, sixth generation of the family, and you, many of you know, I know, he, the grandfather, found this book and he said, this is fabulous. And, and Olivier remembers very well how many times the grandfather talked about this book. But because of uh, this idea of protecting this book, the book went into the safety box. And nobody touched this book for almost 40 years. And when I started looking for the history, looking for the man, looking for the why, the historian lady who helped us immediately, who knew a lot of the history because she's been working with Clico in history. And then they were giving service to us because we're a smaller house because belong, but belonging to the group, we have services, share services, and other houses give us services. In, in things like a purchase or things that don't add value specifically and differentiation uh, to the differentiation of the house. And so Fabienne, who was a historian, she said, Maggie, the history of this house is beautiful and there's something you will be completely touched with. And she came with the, 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 the photocopy of the personal notebook, which immediately made Olivier react because he, he, he knew about it. And when you open this book, you understand the philosophy of the house. He says, my opinion on the champagne and the composition is, and he starts saying to make good wines. So he knows that to make great champagnes, you need to make good wines. And then he said, you need good elements from good terroirs. And then he says something that I would like you to listen to it because I think it applies to everything in life. 
but he's talking to his son and he says, you may create in appearance good champagnes using regular or even mediocre elements. But these are exceptions on which you can never rely or you may damage the operation or lose your reputation. So he's telling this to his son. He says, you go element by element and you don't cheat. And then he says, the most important care has to be taken and then he goes into all the processes of the champagne making. And then he says something that really sets the, the difference and the reason why he decided to develop all these savoir faire because he wanted to have a house with only two champagnes of the same quality. And he, re re he writes, a good house of champagne should only have two champagnes the same quality. And then he has the champagne number one that is about what we have in our glass. And Jerome will take us through what is this 168th edition of the dream of this man. So it's the champagne number one. And he describes this champagne that brings together all flavors and aromas of champagne. It's like a tribute to champagne. We honor champagne every year by bringing together all flavors and aromas of champagne because we use the three great varieties and we go all around champagne. And this was his dream. He honors the region every year, bringing the best in a bottle every single year. And this will be in harmony, all flavors and aromas of champagne. And he describes this as this champagne number one, his dream. And it's the most original champagne of the house, doesn't exist elsewhere. And it is really what he wanted to create. And then he says, the champagne number two will be the champagne of circumstances. And this is what explains why in the house of Krug, the vintages are not the selection of the best wine to make a better champagne, for the selection of those wines better tell the story of the year and to create a champagne that tells us the circumstances of the year. And so this is why the vintages in the House of Crook are not crook through the year, like most of the houses, because it's the philosophy in champagne, but it is the year captured by Crook. And this dream that is translated into this philosophy and to, into these two champagnes today, we have many more, all of them respecting this philosophy. I have to say that I am so proud to have all this history of excellence and exigence that had allowed this house to never lose the way. Even though he lo they lost contact with the roots, they never lost the way. And so I would like to invite Jerome to take us through the savoir faire that he defined in order to get his objective. We cannot say better or worse. It is what he had to do to achieve his objective of champagnes of same quality and every year offer the best he could offer. And this had to uh, uh, develop a, a unique savoir faire that I am very glad to invite uh, Jerome, who is part of the winemaking, who's been eight years, who connects with the growers, and will tell us all about the savoir faire of the house. <laughs> Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Maggie. Um, this is really, really important because today we have so many obsessions, and maybe, maybe we'll tell you some more, but today we have many obsessions around our vineyard around the tastings, around the time, because that's something that we learn when we join Cook. We have to be patient. And I will tell you more about patience. Today, how we create Cook Grand Cuvée 175 years later than the beginning of the house, Joseph Cook told us so many things. And today, we just respect his philosophy with strong obsessions. And the first one Maggie told us plot by plot approach is really, really important. That means something for us. Yes, if I tell you plot by plot approach is really important, you will tell me what does it mean? That means in Champagne, we have more than um, 34,000 hectares. So many thousands plots, that means small garden with vineyard, with vines in. And today at Krug, every single year, 
we make around 250 different points from 250 different plots. That means we go inside the vineyard every day. Like, like today, I was in the vineyard just walking around and see how the vines go today. Because the flowering is done, uh, we are close to see some small berries and maybe the harvest will be probably one of the, the earliest harvests than ever. Um, before 2003 and 2006, we, we will speak about 2006 a little bit later, but this is probably one early harvest that we will have this year and the goal today is to go through the vineyard and just to speak with the growers tell, tell them our philosophy um, the importance about keep everything separate and um, follow every single element that means every year the goal with Cru Grand Cuvée is just a tribute to the Champagne region and its diversity how we can find this diversity again you go directly in the plot you taste the grapes that's just a conversation with the growers to say maybe it's the good time to go in because this is the perfect maturity for crew that means maybe it's not the perfect maturity for everyone but when we are in the vineyard tasting the grapes this is exactly what we are looking for. For example, in the Chardonnay region, because I saw some, some question about Claude du Menil, in the Chardonnay region, when we are tasting the grapes with the growers or in our own beer, we are just looking for something really fresh because the freshness is the key point at Krug, and I will tell you everything about the freshness that keep our, our wines and after our champagnes during decades, it never declined thanks to this freshness. We are looking for fresh aromas, citrusy aromas, and it goes by the peach or apricot, it's too late. It's too late to pick it. You have to go and be in your vineyard, in your plots every day to say, that's the good moment to pick it. Today, we have more than 250 plots. Uh, our own vineyard is about 20 hectares. And the rest is only growers that, that we are working with. And Maggie told us that at the beginning, those growers, we have some strong, strong, strong connection with them because some of them are working with us since 1860s, I think, Maggie, for the family Simon Segonde, they are working more than 100 years with us. And, and, okay, thank you. And I was uh, in Villers Marmerie this afternoon and one grower showed us a paper, I was with Olivier, and he showed us a paper from one plot that we just sold us in 1919. This is a really, really strong connection that we have. They know perfectly what we are looking for and they know perfectly what was the philosophy of Joseph. He wanted to offer the fullest expression of champagne. And when you go in the vineyard, when you do some observation, when you pick it at the good time, you preserve the nature at the good moment, when you keep everything separate, since the beginning, since the beginning you are in the blood, until the final decision of blending five months after, everything is kept separate. This is really important. And that's why we use barrels today, because we have so many questions about the barrels. I, I didn't see one, one question about the barrel, but this is a small container and this is exactly why we are using barrels because when you have a small plot, you press it, it gives you sometimes only two small barrels. That's why we are using barrels. Those small elements are in average 20 years old at crew and we are not using new barrels to keep everything separate. We buy new barrels because we, we have to know everything about those barrels, but they are kept separate and we use it after three years minimum in our process. That's why we are using it, because we keep everything separate. For sure, we are not aging our wines inside barrels and you, you know it, you know perfectly it. We are only using it for keeping everything separate. And after the first tastings, we do the racking and all the wines will be in our cellars in stainless steel tanks, sometimes for two or three months because the blending is coming, sometimes for 15, 16, 20 years, 
you never know. Every element, every musician, musician, sorry, is waiting for the good moment to be a special musician in the symphony of Cook Grandpuré. That's the goal is in the vineyard. We just want to cultivate the difference. That's what we are asking our growers. Please cultivate the difference because more you have differences, more you have contrast, a strong personality, maybe that will be easier to make the blend. And every year that change, every year is different. 2019, for example, we made 278 different points. I don't want to give you so many numbers, but this is just to understand why individuality, why this plot by plot approach is so important for us. Because in the same village, sometimes we make 38, 40 different expressions in the same village. That means one plot is just here, another 10 meters after, and they are completely different. And we have this perfect example, one, one big picture of the Claude du Menil, because I saw some, uh, some question about it. The Claude du Menil is 1.84 hectares. This is a small garden in, uh, the, in downtown village of Claude of Le Menil sur Roger. And this is a small plot, a wall plot, only Chardonnay. But in this little plot, we have different exposure. We have different age of plantations. We have uh, different um, exposure of sun, different soil, different, um, sorry. No. Thank you, Maggie. No. Everything is different and how you can know it? No, it's not only one plot. When you go inside the plot and you taste the grapes, you can split this little plot in four, five, six different micro plots that we picked at different date, that we press at different date, and then we uh, vinify at different date. To give you an example, a small plot like the Clos du Ménil, which is to me one of the most examples of individuality at Peru, this plot sometimes it takes more than 10, 10 days to pick it. 10 days. In Champagne, 1.84 hectare, hectares usually it takes two hours to pick it. This is the precision that we have for every plot. Maggie told you we don't have any high hierarchy between our cuvée, but this is exactly the same in the vineyard. We have the same red carpet in front of every plot. We are using the same technique. Um, maybe we will have some question about sustainability. I will answer with pleasure, but this is exactly the same level of details that we have on every single plot at Pru in our own vineyard, but the same with our growers. Right. This is, to me, the strongest principle that Joseph gave us when he wrote down his philosophy in this notebook, this plot-by-plot -plot approach. After the harvest, it's time to taste, and we are lucky today we are tasting the 168 edition, and maybe I may give you some insights about this edition, but how we create it when we are in the tasting room. We are six of us around Julie Cavill this year, but when I joined the House of Prune, it was Eric Lebel, and I will tell you my first tasting uh, about the 100, it was the 169th edition of Co Grand Cuvée. Maybe it will come soon. Every year, we taste all the plots from the year. For example, 2019, we had 278 different musicians from 2019, different expressions. This is an audition. We are six around the table. This is totally blind. We don't know about the great variety, the village, the grower. We taste blind every sample at 11 in the morning, only 15 plots maximum. And then we start just to, to taste together and speak about this plot to say, wow, this is the first tasting. It's time to take the temperature of the year. It's not time to describe the wine, just to understand what happened this year. In 2019, we said, yes, maybe the Pinots are really interesting in this region because that will give to the, to the blend, the freshness. This one, the Chardonnay from Villers Marnerie will give us the flower and the fruit that we are looking for inside Cougron Cuvée. This is the first tasting. It takes 
two months is just after fermentations. And then we go on holidays, usually it's Christmas in the Christmas time in Champagne, and we come back on January and we taste all the reserve wines. In Champagne, reserve wines, just to know, reserve wines is just wines from past harvest that we keep beautifully in small containers, small stainless steel tanks separately for five, 10, 15, 20 years. Today at Cool, we have some wines in our library of reserve wines from the harvest. Uh, if I'm, I'm correct, because the blend is just done from the beginning of the 2000s. This is really important. The reserve wine are important at Cool to create Cool Grand Cuvée because you have a year, 2019, for example, and sometimes you need to enrich the blend to give it a little bit of spices, a little bit of fruitiness here, is just to have exactly what we are looking for at the end of the blending session. After this tasting of 150 different musicians from past harvest, we are tasting again all the wines from the year, but now they are not in barrels, they are in stainless steel tanks, and now it's more um, we, we go a little bit deeper, we describe the wine, and Julie is starting to imagine which wine, which wine, sorry, will be in Cru Grand Cuvée, because as you know, every year when we recreate Cru Grand Cuvée since the beginning of the house, we don't have any recipe. Every year that changed, every year we have to auditionate 400 musicians, it takes five months, and after those five months, it's time to go a little bit deeper and describe the wines to say, maybe this wine will be in Grand Cuvée, maybe this wine in Coubrosé or the vintage if we have a story to tell this year. After those five months, Julie go directly in, his, in her office, close the door and just playing with all those notes to compose first the, the symphony of Coubrosé. She's working on three, sometimes a little bit more if the year is complicated, for five different propositions of Cru Grand Cuvée. And we are in the lab, all the winemaking team, and we are playing with all those elements, two milliliters of this one, like chemistors, three milliliters of this one, five milliliters of this one. And then we have three different propositions in the lab. We taste it together, and Maggie, we, we did it this year a little bit specially because with the COVID, I know it was COVID. Yeah. We did it. We did it with the mask and everything in different rooms, but we did it and we are bottling it today. We did it, and this, this is just by a vote. We are tasting and say, to me, this is Cru Grand Cuvée. Yes, it looks easy like that, but I told you previously, seven years ago, when I joined the, the tasting committee, I did my first Cru Grand Cuvée around the harvest 2013, and I, I was in front of Eric at that time, and I said, yes, okay, that's, that's really interesting, rich. We have everything what we are looking for when I, I taste Cru Grand Cuvée, but you know, without bubble and without aging, how you can imagine that will be Cru Grand Cuvée that we are tasting together in front of our camera today, how you can imagine that will be Cru Grand Cuvée? Because yes, without bubble, without anything, you are just thinking about the future. That's really, really important to say with uh, really humble and to say, that's the nature. Now it's time to wait seven years and we will taste in few years. Art of blending is really important, as you know now, but seven years after, it's time to taste it. Patience. Patience is really, really, really important. Because we said patience is important. It's a strength at group. It's not a constraint. But sometimes it's a little bit, little bit frustrating, to be honest. Because I did, for example, my first vintage of Claude Mille in 2014. Maybe one day. Maybe one day if we had a, a story to tell around 2014 and if it expressed exactly what we are looking for, for this purity of the Chardonnay, you will probably see it in 2026, 2027. That's why I say patience is really important and that's something that we learned when we joined Probe. This is not only the first thing because I learned another thing when I joined the house. 
you have to forget almost everything that you learned at school. Because we learned a lot of things about, for example, Meunier. Uh, we cannot use Meunier in a prestige QA. This is exactly what we do. Uh, you cannot uh, age Meunier. Uh, we do some reserve wine tastings every year. And I invite you, when you want, to taste some old Meunier that we have in our small containers, small stainless steel tanks. And you will see probably some wines that you have never tasted. This is a key point that you just left all that you that you learned when you joined when you joined the house. And today, I just want to say a few words about what we are tasting because that's the the new bar inside of the house that you are tasting probably in front of your camera. Maybe some of you are tasting a, a vintage, but I tell you more about the vintages just after. But we are tasting the newborn child of the house, Pro Grand Cuvée 168 edition. You know perfectly the concept of edition. That means that the 168 time in a row that we recreate the dream of Joseph. And today, inside your glass, we have 198 different wines, 198 different expressions from 11 different years. And the oldest one is from a small plot and I will tell you why we use this plot just after. A plot from Vexenay, Pinot Noir, 96. Maybe you have in mind some words about 96. It was a really, really fresh year in Champagne, and it gave us some really fresh wines. And this is exactly what this little spice gave us around this Grand Cuvée. I told you the oldest, but maybe the youngest you have it because it was crafted around the harvest. 2012. That means the youngest wine inside is 2012. It was a year, I mean, if I can tell you a few words about 2012, really, really, really complicated for us because in Champagne we had so many climatic incidents. But I, I, I don't want to give you every incident that we had, but so many rains, storms, frost, hail frost, we had everything in 2010. <laughs> small crop, small crop, but really, really strong personalities. And the, the game, if I may, it wasn't the game, but when it was time to play with all those musicians at that time, around the harvest 2012, it was just to calm down a little bit those strong personalities with reserve wine that, that gave it this roundness, this richness, this a strong characters, this paradoxes between freshness, roundness, fruitiness, dried fruit, fresh fruit, everything is here and it's exactly what we wanted to express when we decided to create Pou Grand Cuvée 168 edition at that time. Okay, that's a lot of information when I tell you 198 different wines. Usually we are not around the table with you when you are tasting an edition of Pou Grand Cuvée. Maggie, a few years ago, create something that can help you every day when you are tasting a bottle of Krug, not only Krug Grand Cuvée, all the Krug have this little code. And Maggie, I give you the, the mic to explain how you can know everything about Krug. Thank you, Jerome, because now you all will understand. You imagine that you are there in the house. And of course, after my failure, I said to Eric, Eric, please, Invite me to everything you do, because you may be doing things I don't know, and I must know to understand better this house. And this is February 2010, when he invited me, and he said, of course, you have to come to the tasting with the growers. So in the house of crew, the growers come to taste the result of their work. So if we have three plots with one grower, the person will come with a team, and they will, we will taste three wines. And we will discuss about every plot, work, what we have done, the picking date, and all the things. I remember this tasting as it was yesterday. The first wine was all about food. It was incredible. The second one was very discreet on the nose, but the, the palate was fabulous and length, fantastic. And the third was overripened. And I said, this is not good. And of course, the lady, the owner of this a plot in Buzi, she was very, you know, happy. And then Eric said, yes, madam, I have to tell you, 
that I have the intuition, you pick these three plots the same day. And I have told you always that that plot, because it's very exposed to the sun, it has to be picked five, six days before. And I have the intuition you did it the same day. This lady had the manager of the vineyard to the right, and he confirmed the guy wanted to disappear. <laughs> that it was picked the same day. And then Eric said, well, madam, we are so sorry, but this plot will have to leave the house. It's not, we of course paid it, it went into a blend that leaves the house and will never be called and, and used by any of our champions. And you imagine me, I said, wow, every bottle of crook is layers of wines that have been connected to every plot and have been tasted, appraised and selected to be there because they all have the level. So you imagine I had this experience in February 2010, and then in April 2010, I found this little book that we found, the little book that I, sh I shared that was, you know, you, you can use the mediocre elements, but you don't use it. And it was amazing. And, and, and this was such an experience. And then you imagine when you realize all the creation process around. And I said to the team, but do you realize what you're doing? around the creation of Cru Grand Cue, we have to tell the world. People want to know, what is the story of this bottle? Tell me what is inside. It is why. This is what I'm interested in. When I see a great bottle of wine, tell me the story, the person who made it, what for? And I said, we have to tell these stories. Of course, the house was in panic. No, we had never said anything, we cannot. And so everything I propose, you have to imagine, this is a Latin American coming into a French house, crook, okay? Telling we have to do this and that. And of course they said, no, no, we cannot. No, we cannot, what we cannot. And then I said, okay, we cannot do anything. Perfect. So we're gonna leave a, little, no, a, laser, a laser in the line. I'm gonna put a little number in the back of the label. And the production manager said, a number? And how it's going to be called this number. And I said, it's going to be the crook ID. And because I have heard the clients and they are all frustrated because they want to know about the disgorgement of the bottle, we will build this number by giving first number is the quarter and second two numbers is the year. And then the rest is the lot. And like this, they will like this bottle. You turn, it's 219 immediately. I don't need anything. I know that this bottle has received the cork in the second quarter of the year 19, because the date is not relevant, but the period it is. So I said, we're gonna do it that way. We started manually. And I remember when the production manager came up in, in my office and said, oh Maggie, I made a mistake. Instead of 212, I put 221. And I, and I just look at him and I was laughing. And I say, don't worry, Pascal. We are going to tell your story in the Crook ID story. So the idea of this little number was that you could find the story of this bottle using digital universe. So I said, I am a system engineer. And I have always thought that systems are there to service the, the needs. And so I said, well, let's use digital. And in the digital world, we will just tell the story of the year. Of course, at the beginning, the house didn't want to say everything. And I said, what can I say? Can I, say, can I tell the number of wines? And Eric said, yes. Can I keep the oldest year? He said, yes. Can I keep the, the youngest? No. <laughs> and I remember having Jan's telling me, this is great, Maggie, congratulations, but you're not giving much information. And I said, come on, Jan, you cannot change 160 years of a house. <laughs> This will need uh, one year and I will give you everything. And today, I invite you all because in 2014, we had crook.com and then we have an application that is free, complete. It's the only free thing crook has done so far. <laughs> uh, available in Apple. Uh, next year, we will do it in Android. And uh, the idea is that you can access it. It's crook, it's called crook, it's a square cherry and crook. And there you can, use it also, it's very easy. You can scan the little ID or you can uh, um, dial the number and then you will get access to the story of the book. So Jerome will not be there, 
but you will definitely read that you have the 198 wines of 11 different years and it'll give you all the story and then you can go on and then you can have the composition and then you will have julie telling all the story of this creation and then you will have some tips like you don't use flutes and temperature and then you have the music you see because we are very musical in our approach because we have the soliste and we have the music of the year in the, in, the, in the vintages and we have the music of champagne. And I said, it is so easy to understand the house using music. And so we started doing some experiments, just like an analogy. And I was in Hong Kong and I had this first experience. We gave the champagnes to Richard Vampin and he decided to select the music to go with. And I remember it had, it was Claude de Menil 2000. And then he selected the Casals, the Song of Freedom. And then he started playing with his cello. And I said, what is going on here? And the, the tasting was different. And then the second, and then the third, and then the fourth. It was magic. And I came back to the house and I said, look to the team, we have to invite musicians to come to the house to taste our champagnes and select the music that goes with. We didn't know that was science behind. We just started experimenting and it was great. And then in 2015, I said, come on, this is too strong. We have to find out. Science must be behind. And this is how in 2015, uh, we found that there was Spencer and the other University of Edinburgh, Oxford University with laboratories, because in the brain, the, the earring is next, very close to tasting. The nose is a little further, but it's not so far. And so the music will resonate. And what happens is like vibration, and then you have flavors. And even some people with a, with a good nose can feel aromas. They, they didn't feel in a normal circumstance. We don't want to bring any techniques to this. We just want to invite people to connect to our application or crook.com and you get all the different musicians. Some of them selected the music. Some of them had developed, created the music for every one of the champagnes. And you can have a different experience. And what we love from this is that people will concentrate in their sensations and there is no rationalization. Because you know what? Wines and champagnes, we are there. To give you pleasure. What is the best champagne? The one you love and gives you pleasure. If this one gives you pleasure, we had made it, but it is you decide. So I would like to invite uh, Jerome to take us through the vintages, because vintages are in the house of crew, as we said, and it was clear in the, in the little diary, uh, the champagne of circumstance. So it'll be interesting to, to, to learn the circumstances of 2004 and the circumstances of 2006, which were radically different, and then you have two different champagnes. So let's, uh, let's discover this, Jerome. Thank you, Meli. Joseph told us 175 years ago, this is the circumstances to be. That means we have to let the circumstance of the year tell us a story. If we don't have a story to tell, we don't want to make a vintage. I, I saw a question, 2012 was a vintage for Krug. No, unfortunately, we had a perfect story to tell in 2012. But as you know, every year we start to recreate Krug on Cuvée first, and we want to keep some wines in our library of reserve wines to think about the future of Krug on Cuvée. That's why in 2012, we didn't make a vintage. 2012, perfect year to, to tell a story of a lot of storms, rain, and we had a perfect quality maturity during the harvest, but it was a small crop. As I told you previously with the 168 edition, that's why we didn't make a vintage. For sure, we had a story, but not enough. We always think about who grand cuvée. The stories of 2004 and 2006, they are so different and it's exactly why we are creating vintages at Krug. Why we are presenting you 
two vintages in the same time. Why we made the decision to say, no, 2006 doesn't replace 2004? Because we just want to show you our philosophy about vintages. They are so different. Maggie told us, it's not the year through prove. It's not prove through the year, sorry. This is the year just, we, we told just the year through this bottle of 2004, for example. Maybe you are in front of your camera and you are tasting this particular vintage, generous year, fresh year 2004. It was for us um, a really generous year. It was for sure just after 2003. And you will tell me, Jerome, I know 2004 comes just after 2003. But 2003 in Champagne was really complicated. We had two frosts at the beginning of the year. We lost the majority of our Chardonnay regions. We lost the majority of the crop in 2003. And usually, we are lucky with the vineyard when you have a small year with a lot of climatic incidents. The year just after is more generous. 2004, it was a dry year, really fresh, um, really straight, pure. And the Chardonnay were probably the winners of the year because they expressed this freshness of the year. And when you are tasting 2004, it's just to express this freshness, this generosity. And this is probably the third vintage at Pru with the majority of Chardonnay. That's unusual, but as you know, everything is based on tasting. It's not the best of the class which compose the blend of the vintage. It's just the ones which express the most together the story of the year. And in 2004, we used the majority of Chardonnay. We did it for sure in 81 and 98, but 2004 is the third vintage with the majority of Chardonnay. This is one member of the second trilogy of Proof because as you know perfectly, we have one trilogy with 88, 89, and 90, which are three completely different stories. And we did 2002, 2003, and 2004, for sure, they are, they are so different. If maybe one day you have the chance to taste all those vintages together, you will see they are really, really, really different. 2006, another story. That's the newborn child of the house. We presented it at the end of uh, 2019, maybe, if I'm, if I'm correct. I, I was in Hong Kong and all of us were all around the world to present the story of 2006. The story of um, um, circumstances complicates because it was a hot year. Maybe today when we are talking about a hot year in Champagne, this is almost every year uh, because now since 10 years, every year, the harvest is earlier, 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 earlier. But at the beginning of 2000s, we had only one early harvest. It was 2003. And after we had 2006. It was a really, really warm uh, summer, hot summer. Um, the grapes were just perfect. Everything were perfect, was perfect, sorry. But in August, the climate was more capricious with us. We had almost two months, more than two months of rain in only 16 days. What does it mean in Champagne in August when it's warm? You are close to the harvest in August. You have some sugar in your berries. You have a lot of rains. Sometimes disease comes with a lot of rains. We were lucky. Sometimes we are happy to say with Maggie and Julie, we have a champagne, a champagne's miracle every year because the climate is sometimes capricious. And remember this name of capricious because every year we give a, a nickname to every vintage and maybe capricious will be there. I will ask you at the end, what, what is the nickname of 2006? A hot summer, a lot of indulgence, a lot of richness, contrast, spices, but fruitiness and um, really strong, really powerful. And the goal was just to manage those powerful characters in 2006. And when you taste it, you have this roundness with the, this sunny, sunny summer, but you have this capricious August with spices, with freshness, and we had a perfect harvest. Everything was so clean and we were so happy 
to, uh, to present you the story of 2006 because it was capricious and indulgent. Now it's time to, to ask you about the nickname of 2006, maybe. <laughs> maybe you can, you can tell us. And is a cap uh, capricious uh, sto what? stormy? In capricious indulgence. indulgence. Capricious indulgence. <laughs> Uh, and the 2004 was luminous freshness. And you see the 2004 is like a vertical champagne. It's vertical. I always say it's like stairs to heaven. Mm -hmm. And then you have a 2006, it's round. It's like a big canapé, you know, fluffy, puffy. You see, it's a very, very different. It's a different year, so you have two different champagne. Yeah. And then uh, we have the two clos. So it's the, yes. like, the house. So we have the crew clothing. Those two clothes are really particular, as you know. Uh, oh, sorry, my connection is not good. I'm here now. Is it perfect? Yeah, perfect. Sorry. Those two clothes are really particular because, as you know, this is a small plot. For Clos du Menil, this is 1.84 hectares. And for uh, Ambonnet, this is 0 0.68 hectares. That's so many numbers, but that's like a small garden. And how we discovered it, because this is really important to know how we discover, discovered it. Because you know perfectly, we pick everything separate, we taste everything separate. And the story of the Clos du Menil, for example, it was built in 71 with a, with a little bit more uh, plots around the village, but this uh, special plot was there. And every year, um, the fifth generations and the, uh, the fourth generations of food decided to taste it separately, but as you know, we taste everything separately. And every year they say, you know, when you taste blind, blind sorry, you say, this is really interesting. This one, I know it. Probably I had it last year, but this is really specific. This is exactly what I'm looking for, for the purity of the Chardonnay. Okay, now it's time to discover which wine it is. This is a wine from Claude Dumini. Ha! Oh, this is the second time I say that. Okay, let's see next year. 73. We taste again. We say, ha! Oh, this is again the Claude Dumini. I recognize it. And they, they, they decided, and it was one question that I saw at the beginning of uh, Connect. I saw which was the, what was the first vintage of Claude Dumini? It was 79. Why 79? Because this for us was fabulous and it expressed totally what we are looking for for this purity of the Chardonnay. And every year when we are making the Clos du Menil, it's exactly the same for the other plots. We taste the grapes and we are, we are looking for something really precise, this freshness, citrusy aromas, and the goal is to pick it at the good time, just to preserve the nature at the good time and maybe, maybe, when we taste those four, five, six different plots from this little garden, we will make a Claude Mini. This is the soloist of the house. We have the other one, which is a little bit younger because that's the beginning of the 90s that we bought it. This is the Claude Ambonnet. This is 100% Pinot Noir and only one year. Anytime with Claude Mini and Claude Ambonnet, this is a story of a year. This is only one plot. This is only one great variety. And the goal is just to express you the purity of every great variety in those little small garden of vines. I saw a question about 96 and I, I can maybe answer more generally, not only on 96 because uh, it will continue to age. This is something that we have uh, always, this is, a question that I answer by another question. Uh, usually when I, I, I taste Cru Grand Cuvée or every Cru, I told you previously, this is something, we, we are looking for something, the freshness. How we describe the freshness, it's only when you taste it, you feel something really fresh, pure, and how you can keep a bottle of champagne during decades as Cru can do, this is thanks to this freshness. I want to say, anytime you will open a bottle of Krug, if you keep it in good condition, this, yeah. this is the only, the only thing that we have to do when we keep Krug or other, other house, you have to keep it in good conditions. If you keep it in good conditions, 
it will never decline. That means when you open a bottle of Cru Grand Cuvée or 96, um, because I had these questions, or 2003 or 2004, you will never have a declining champagne. Yes, it involved. Aromas involved during the time. Maybe you had the chance to do the, the Creations 2006 tasting. You probably had the vintage 2006. And close to this vintage, the 162nd edition of Cru Grand Cuvée. Mm. When you taste the 162nd edition of Cru Grand Cuvée today, you see today we are testing the 168. This is an extra aging of six years. This is something a little bit more toasty that, that, we, that we can have today with the 168 edition. This is exactly the way it evolved during the time if it if it's kept in good conditions. All your champagnes, all your group champagnes can be tasted in 10, 15, 20, 30 years if you want. The only thing is how you want to taste your Krug, how you like your Krug Grand Cuvée. It's more a personal opinion than a declining champagne. You will never have something declining. Yeah, this is why we decided to put the edition, and it was in 2017, so we had the, the ID, but of course the ID was not enough. I remember in Italy serving the three different IDs, and it was crazy, the poor guys were, you know, it was not right. And then we decided to put the edition, so you can identify, you can follow it, and you can, you know, you can have these later tastings and discover how the champagne will continue to evolve. And this is why we have the collection. But why if this man said the champagne were the same quality? We don't have a collection of Cru Grand Cure. Well, we have bottles there waiting for them to be one day collection, probably in 15 years or 12 years, uh, there will be a first before a first collection of, um, of uh, Cru Grand Cure because there's no reason why not to have a collection. So what we have is a champagne that will grow and will give you more. It's like you open little windows, you bring roundness and new flavors, and new layers. So it gets more complex. And this is what is about the champagne in time. And I saw one question and I passed the hand to Lily because somebody asked about Krug 2008 and I know everybody's waiting for Krug 2008. And <laughs> you have to wait and it's good to wait. And it's worth waiting because it's really good. <laughs> and, and, um, and so it will come next year, not this year. It will be ready next year, 2021, at the end of the year, 2021. So I would say that we pass the hand to Lily. Before, before going uh, taking the questions, I wanted to tell you that um, Krug ran away now with the addition and with the ID. Ideally, ideally is to keep it for time. So we don't ask anybody to, to uh, or after they may keep some for you later, but the idea is as you do with the vintage, the edition will go, a new edition will come, and I invite you to really enjoy 2000, the 168. It is the first edition where we move from the idea of taste to a vision the vision of bringing together the generosity of champagne. So this is the beauty of all these years that have taken us to a totally different dimension. And what we do is to look for new sounds to incorporate it in this symphony. And probably the first year, the harvest, that where this vision was installed, we moved away from taste. The taste is a fixed stop. And we moved to a vision. And now it's always this vision of the most generous expression of champagne. Every year, it's going to be different because the process is different, because the 400 wines are different, but especially because we are enriching the vision, we are working differently our plots, we are getting more purity, more preciseness, and uh, the whole idea is that uh, we will keep moving forward to every year bring the most beautiful expression of what we believe is the most generous expression of champagne. So having said so, I pass the hand to Lily. Okay, I think I have a perfect to to the question to follow up that statement about trying to age your Grand Cuvée. And your friend Zulema in New York asks, 
what is the oldest bottle you have had of Grand Cuvée and what might be the oldest bin store edition that Krug has of Grand Cuvée at the Maison? Well, truly, I have to tell you a story. Yeah, when I said where to this, uh, we had a, an employee who had been in the house for 30 years. So when I realized all this, I said to this man, Didier, I said, Didier, where are the creations of Grand Cuvée? And he said to me, oh, no, we have never kept. And I said, okay, well, you need to look for different creations. There is no way you, we have, you know, a prestige champagne is not a nice bottle with a high price. A prestige champagne is a champagne that will grow through the passage of time. We need to show the beauty of the oldest creation. So he understood and he said, I'm going to help you, Mike. Give me one moment. And he found eight different creations. And we put even little nicknames. Some of them in, in, in the OS in an auction that we did uh, uh, to, 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 just to open up this story because it was crazy not to identify every crook grand cure. And uh, the oldest I had is about the 80s. It was, I, I think it was 85. And it was absolutely fabulous. But, um, Olivier has had older Krug Grand Cuvées because now we go around the world and we invite people to come with their old, because our clients, they have more bottles than us. We have no bottles. And so at that time, we found some bottles in the cellars because uh, this Didier became like a, 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 a police looking for all kinds of bottles in our cellars, in our, in our house. And we kept some bottles and honestly, Probably the best champagne I have ever had in my life was a bottle of the Crook Grand Cuvée created around 96. And we only found 14 bottles. And unfortunately, now the 10 bottles left are in the patrimony of the house. And this is the pity that we want this, we won't uh, like this to happen ever again. Because, you know, the creations are now, you can identify the story by the Crook ID. You can identify the, the, the edition with the edition and do not rely on the year of the creation of the Grand Cure as the key factor for the beauty of it. Do not do this because you may be enormously surprised. The 159th edition is the edition around 2003. Okay? And this edition that next year we will present some cases because we decided that we're going to bring you know, like 10 years after, because people haven't kept. So we're going to be, bring to the market few cases of this. This creation, 159, is being, the, the, the Grand Cuvée is being created with many wines of 96. And when you taste it today, it's so impressive. So do not think that the, the 168 is just because of the year 2020. No. You will be surprised by what the older uh, uh, vintages, the older wines from the reserve wines. Remember, they are all musicians. They've been practiced. And this wine of 96 that is in this edition, it practiced for so many years before going into this bottle that this very little percentage changed the whole blend. It was impressive. And so do not rely only in the year you may have amazing surprises. Um, kind of following up on that uh, and kind of the Krug ID project and different innovations you've brought to the house, are there any things that you're excited to do in the future as you bring Krug into another 200 years or as you approach 200 years of Krug, I guess? Yes, you, I, I love your question because honestly, I think we, you know, we started by fixing all the way we communicated discovering ourselves, bringing experiments now into the music, uh, change well, uh, with the ID, the uh, labels, you know, and we keep doing, we, we, are keep, we keep evolving in this envy of communicating or giving. And so what we are doing now, we have two axes. One is that since few years, we select the solist that we have in the house. Probably is not Claude Menil, probably is not Claude Monet, but there is a solist of that year, and we bought it. So this is something new, 
and it'll come out in like uh, 10 years or <laughs> have the first product in seven years. Here, everything is slow. I will be totally <laughs> okay. In my life. And uh, what we're doing, which is great, is that we moved in the, in the last, uh, I would say, since Eric arrived, so we're moving forward every day more. This is something Jerome takes care, which is now we're going deep into what is uh, the, the philosophy, the, the viticulture philosophy, bringing the growers with us. They all work super great, but they have to be certified. They don't have the means because they are small. So we bring them with a collective. It, we are you know, having a very a totally organic approach to the soil. And we are bringing now biocontrol approach to the food. So the idea is that we want to become the experts in terroir in Champagne. Because we've been working like this since 170 years, 75 years. You know, we are now exploring the soil. I can pass the hand to, to Jerome so he tells you what we are doing. And I will just conclude this point by telling that there is a project developed by Julie Gaville. Four years she worked on this project to build the center of excellence of our wines because there is the global warming. We felt our little oak barrels were getting too dry. We were needing too much water to, to uh, hydrate them. And we decided that we needed to move one step forward. And this was totally Julie's initiative. And I totally back it. And so in Claude Ambonnet, that I will share with you something, but Jerome will tell you, because I love this thing about energy, and Jerome will tell you about it. And on, in the land of Claude Ambonnet, we will build the center of excellence where we assure that all conditions, the perfect conditions for keeping the balance, for the birth of our wines, for keeping our wines, for blending, for bottling, will be the perfect conditions. So this tells you that all we are doing now to know better our plots, to understand our terroir, to connect them, because since five years we have the Black Book, Jerome is the boss of Black Book, which is a digital tool in which we, we take all the, um, the, um, the tasting notes. So we can follow what we've been doing in the, in the vineyard and we can follow it in the result of the tastings. And so following, then precision, because we're getting to know the terroir, will give us at the end more knowledge of every one of our terroirs. And I, my dream is that we can share this with the Champagne region and everybody can learn from our experience. And uh, this uh, installation that was going to start this year, but because of the COVID, we had to delay it to next year. This project will give the perfect conditions for the 100 years to come. And I can guarantee you the best is yet to come in the House of Proof. Because of all we are doing now, where Jerome is actively working in all the vineyard approach. Yes, this, this is really interesting because today we spoke about the, the Black Book and I will tell you exactly what it is um, and how it's a perfect tool to know uh, the, the, the climate change, uh, how the, the growers are working in their vineyard, how we can give them some, some feedback because today, as Maggie said, we are bringing them together and we are founded a community around us, not because we know everything, no, because we just want to learn together in the same time and grew up in the same time, not only about sustainability, because sustainability is really, really, really important, but it's not only in the vineyard, it's around us and you spoke about the future because this is something that Maggie really liked to say we are like a gate between the past and the future and everything that we are creating today is just uh, to serve the future we spoke about this project in Ambonnet yes we want to be the reference uh, about the knowledge is around the terroir in Champagne not because we just want to know for us but we want to know for everybody we are working with the university in Dijon, in Burgundy. They went to our vineyard in Le Méni sur Roger and spent one week just to, to, make, to, to dig the, the earth to know perfectly our soils. It takes a lot of times, it takes a lot of times to see it, to understand it, 
and to make some observations to say this plot, at the bottom of this plot, you have this eel, at the bottom you have maybe 1.6 meters of soils, but here you have only 0 0.3 meters of soils. You cannot cultivate your vineyard in the same plot in the same way, because inside the same plot, everything is different. And it's exactly, it's exactly what we are, uh, what we want to know to cultivate the differences directly in the vineyard, not only in our own vineyard, but with the growers. Sustainability is really important. And to me, sustainability means transmission. Transmission, Maggie probably tell us a bit more after, but this is a, a key point at Krug. What we are doing, we are just preparing the keys for the next generations. That's why we created the Black Book because we wanted to know every year what's happening in our vineyard, but in the vineyard of our growers. If they make something in their vineyard, they, they do an experiment. We can taste it with them because we keep everything separate and tell them ah, this year, this is really interesting, but maybe something is missing. Just try this year to, to work in this way and maybe we will see after. The Black Book is the tool that can give you all those informations because every year you can give some feedback to your growers and say, maybe this year go in this way, maybe in this, this year go in this way. And we will grow together around the terroir, uh, around the transmission, around the climate change. Because when we speak about climate change, we are just talking about earliest harvest. It's not the only key point for the climate change. And we have to know all those elements, terroir, tastings, and growing together uh, around sustainability, organic, about all those elements to be maybe the reference that we want to do, that we want to be of the terroir in Champagne. That's, that's the goal. And this vision takes time. We prepared it a few years ago, but we enforce it five years ago with the creation of this black book and this community of wine growers which are working who are working with Krug since decades but now they are working with us in the same way and we are just growing together so this is my next project you see <laughs> so this is the next dream wow. so so we are very happy to know that there is a lot still to do most definitely. Well, Irv, do you have any, any more questions for, for Maggie and the team? No, I have, I have one more question. I also have a, 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 a thing to say. So I, I did a little uh, historical research on our own, and it was, it was uh, interesting to see that we've sold more Krug than any champagne in the world. And I looked on how much Krug we've sold between all our various departments, was forty million dollars of Krug so far? No. no. So congratulations. In line, with that, in line with that, I did want to ask you because I think we're both very interested in climate change and uh, and the the science of viticulture. Um, and I know you've been spending some time on it. And I was curious, um, what Krug is doing to address some of those, like Jerome referenced, and and what do you? What do you see happening as we continue to, to see the, the impact of, of climate change? Well, you see what Jerome explained. Yeah. Any of what he explained is what we are doing to address the climate change. Right. The climate change, he said it, is advancing, you know, is accelerating the harvest time. And so we know it. And it's drying our, our oak barrels. We know it. And we need the conditions for the birth of our wines, and we need the right temperature because we clarify it naturally, and we need the temperature to make sure that we clarify properly. So there is a lot of things that happen where we need the conditions. So we have the projects being already approved by the group. It's just the, it's the start of the of the building, and then all the approach in the vineyards, the the organic approach, the way we work the vineyard to make sure that roots go down into the natural process, yeah. And so there is a lot of work we are doing today, but honestly, if we do the right things, Champagne gets benefited from the global warming. Doing the right things, 
we can really get a lot of expression. We can get the beauty of fruit expression much more than uh, than when you were just very, very uh, at the north and, and very, very, very cold. Uh, so we can maximize, and we, but we have to work differently. Yeah. And this is what we are doing today. Great. Well, thank you so, so think, much. I'm, I'm sure everybody- Thank you very here. much. You're my, you're, yes, you're my favorite- We took, we took half an hour of your time. <laughs> it was really fabulous. Jerome, it was a pleasure. Thank you for all your insights. Thank you very much. Thank we you look you forward much. to drinking many more bottles of crude with you and seeing the future expression. I hope so. Irv, I will take these two seconds because there is a question about Rosé. Okay. I will take, uh, we already stole 25 minutes from you, so it's very good. <laughs> you, know, you will forgive us. And, uh, but uh, Rosé, Rosé is a fifth generation. In the 70s, they created the Cru de Menin, and then uh, later in 95, it was the first Cru d'Abonnet. Uh, but in the 70s, the Rosé in the world were like, uh, you know, excess of everything, excess of flavors, excess of colors, excess of taste. And, um, and then uh, the, the, the Remy Krug used to go around the world and the Rosé, uh, everybody was asking when the House of Krug is going to have a Rosé. And the, quest, the answer of the father every time he came with the point, ah, father, everybody's asking us, he says, never, this house will never have a Rosé. You know? Rosé is vulgar and this house will never have a vulgar Chandon. <laughs> Father retired, he, the two brothers decided, it was a warm year, 76. He retired in February 77, but when you retire in February, it's the middle of a cycle, you don't participate. So he left the songs, but taking care of the harvest of 76, all the process, until the bottling, and you know, every bottle you have in front of you. If this bottle is the harvest of 2012, around 2012, you know it's been bottled bottled in June 2013. It's a most the house. In June of this, house, of this year, all the creations around the harvest of 19 had been bottled. This is a philosophy. So you don't, he didn't participate. The, the year was warm, 76. And then I arrived in one plot of us that is in IE, and the Pinot Noir were ready for a red wine. Not anymore for base wines for champagne. And so they said, let's create a rosé that doesn't exist. And they, create, they decided to create a rosé about boldness and elegance. So it's about bringing all the fruits together, go and select from the year what is left in fruit and all the other ex fruit expressions in the, in the reserve. And they create like a shawl of fruits or false sword. And then there is this red uh, wine that is going to bring spices, structure and color. And then you create the rosé that it's a, it's a very bold rosé, but it's about finesse and elegance at the same time. And it is not at all for dessert, unless the dessert is so It's great to accompany tasty food like lamb, and you will be amazed with it. So, so this is a rosé was born in 76, the creation, and presented in 84. And the grandfather said, what is this? And the, the, the two sons said, this is a rosé. And the stories that he smell and he says, oh, we are in a problem. Somebody's copying crook in champagne. And the son said, no, no, this is, this is our experiment. And then he said, I will approve it because this is crook before being a rosé. So this is a nice way to close and to thank you very much. Thank Here. you very, very much. Appreciate thank you. For these opportunities. Cheers. Thank you so much. And Cheers. So much. Cheers to every one of you. We don't see you, but we see you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.